let's take a look at four major shortcomings in the Schur hypothesis. We will find the Schur hypothesis comes up short four different ways. It's reliance on inclusive counting, Nissan or Tishri reckoning, the time available between the eclipse and Passover in the year of Herod's death, and the testimony of historians Appian and Diocassius. Let's consider each in turn. First, inclusive counting. This is absolutely central to the Schur hypothesis. This isn't just an ancillary nice to have. The entire hypothesis comes crumbling down if we do not use inclusive counting. There's no way to get Herod to his 37th year, even at the earliest possible date for his appointment by Rome, and dead in 4 BC. We have to have inclusive reckoning in order to get Schur's hypothesis to work. Well, what evidence do we have in favor of either? As I mentioned earlier, there are indeed historical precedents, including Jewish rulers, using inclusive counting and not using inclusive counting. It's difficult to be certain without an outside source of information whether Josephus is using inclusive counting or not in a given time and place. Well, we do have several other data points that probably answer this question. Josephus also reckons the tenure of the high priests at the same time and in the same place as Herod, and he does not use inclusive counting for the terms of office of the high priests. So yes, Josephus uses inclusive counting elsewhere, but in the time and place of Herod, he's clearly showing us we're not using inclusive counting here. Furthermore, we have Josephus' testimony that Herod conquered Jerusalem 27 years after Pompey conquered Jerusalem. Pompey conquers Jerusalem in 63 BC, 27 years later is 36 BC. Now some have said, well, well no, he's, he's doing inclusive counting there as well. This is a stretch that is definitely not the sense of the passage in Josephus. It definitely sounds like Josephus is saying 27 years have elapsed, not this is the 27th year, meaning 26 years have elapsed. So it's a real stretch to say that, but the advocates of the sure hypothesis have taken this position. There's a problem there. Josephus doesn't just tell us 27 years or the 27th year. He actually gives us the terms of office of the high priest during that time, and if you add them up, it adds up to 27 years. Josephus isn't talking about 26, he's talking about 27. I'm indebted to Andrew Steinman for this insight. I'll be relying heavily upon his work. There's a link in the description of the video to additional papers by Steinman that provide a lot of the details and the analysis we'll be considering here. Finally, there's a problem from the numismatic evidence, the coins. Remember, we have multiple attestations that these events are three years apart. One of them is the coins. Herod doesn't have a kingdom when he's appointed king. The Roman general Sosius goes to help him conquer Jerusalem and install him as king. After he gets set up in office, he mints coins. This is something that makes sense for a ruler to do. It's a way of establishing, I'm the one in charge now, my name is on your coins. When he mints these coins, they're minted as year three. Now, it's widely held that Herod has to mint these coins after he gets to Jerusalem, because now he has a mint and he has a, a kingdom in which he can disseminate these coins. But if his reign is being reckoned inclusively, whether we start with 40 or 39, 40, 39, 38, 37 would be his fourth year. So if we start with 39, 39, 38, 37, 36, 36 would be his fourth year. So whether we go with possibility A or possibility B, Herod should be minting his first coins in Jerusalem in year four if his reign is being reckoned inclusively. But the coins say year three. Thus, we have surviving testimony, physical evidence, saying Herod's reign is not being reckoned inclusively. Those coins say year three, meaning the first year of Herod's reign was treated as an accession year, and he wouldn't have counted year one until the following three years. We've shown, then, that Herod is not reckoning his reign inclusively, and Josephus is not using inclusive counting for the terms of office and people in the same time and place as Herod. This definitely stacks the deck against inclusive reckoning. The reason it's preferred is because it's necessary to get this March of 4 BC eclipse to work. We will deal a final fatal blow to inclusive reckoning when we get to point four. For now, what we've shown is we've got the evidence from Herod and the evidence from Josephus supporting non-inclusive reckoning. Inclusive reckoning is supported merely by the desire to arrive at a particular conclusion. When we let the evidence speak for itself, we'll get a much simpler solution that doesn't require opposing the clear sense of what is said by Josephus and what is minted on Herod's coins. Number two, Nisan or Tishri. These are months in the Jewish calendar. I should acknowledge, this came up after one of my other videos, there is debate 
about the proper pronunciation of this word. I've been pronouncing it Nissan. I've heard it pronounced at least four different ways. I certainly mean no offense to those who pronounce it a different way. This is actually a common phenomenon in ancient languages that in written form only used consonants for many years, including, for example, in Semitic languages, including vowel markers to tell you the vocalization of a word didn't come about until years after the Old Testament. And so there are a number of words where there's debate about the proper pronunciation. We know the consonants, we're not sure what vowels would have been pronounced. So I will continue to use Nissan as my pronunciation. I will acknowledge there are other pronunciations out there. End of aside, but I, I wanted to clarify that. Nissan or Tishri, this is a question of when is New Year's on the calendar of Herod's reign? And someone said, well, shouldn't New Year's just be January 1st? It would be on the Roman calendar, but Herod was king of the Jews. And it is pretty close to universally acknowledged by people who support and oppose the sure hypothesis that Herod's reign is going to be reckoned on a Jewish calendar. Well, which one? The Jewish religious calendar is reckoned from the month of Nisan in the spring. The Jewish civil calendar is reckoned from the month of Tishri in the fall. There are very strong opinions on this issue, and there are reasonable people making rational arguments in support of both. Pick one, Nisan or Tishri. I can give you evidence in favor and evidence opposed. My suggestion is there is not decisive enough evidence to be dogmatic on this issue. Some have taken a pretty hard line on this one. I'm going to say, in order to not overspecify the evidence, I'm going to remain open to both possibilities. The Herodians could have reckoned their reigns from Nisan. They could have reckoned them from Tishri. You'll find plenty of sources who say, no, it must be this or it must be that. And they'll cite a lot of good examples in favor. The problem is there's good examples in favor of both. So I'm not going to take a position on this one, but I do need to acknowledge, because this will come up later, the sure hypothesis requires Nisan. Herod must have reckoned his reign from the first of Nisan, not Tishri. Otherwise, the sure hypothesis does not work. Why? Because... If Herod is appointed by Rome in 40 BC, that means year two would begin, the first of Nisan in 39. Herod dies in the spring of 4 BC. He doesn't make it to the first of Tishri in 4 BC, and so he'd still be in year 36. Whereas, if he dies in the spring of 4 BC, if he's reckoning his reign from the first of Nisan, he would have just, just barely passed New Year's on that calendar and he would be in his 37th year. So he didn't reign 37 years. He didn't even make it to a full 36 years. But on inclusive reckoning from the first of Nisan, he was in his 37th year. The sure hypothesis then requires inclusive reckoning. It also requires using the first of Nisan as the calendar date on which New Year's is reckoned on Herod's reign. 